Our first talk is coming from a graduating senior undergrad at the University of Washington. Join me in welcoming Nick Saunders. Bachelor of Science in Astrophysics and a Bachelor of Arts in Cinema Studies. So what you're going to see up here is basically what the inside of my brain looks like most of the time. <laughs> uh, so as you can see, we're starting off with this gorgeous view of the twin sunset over the desert planet Tatooine. And by the end of this show, we will return to this beautiful sunset. But first, I'm going to I'm going to talk about a few of the more recent uh, popular sci-fi movies and kind of analyze what they've done right and wrong. So we're going to start with fan favorite, Interstellar, <laughs> science advisor, Dr. Kip Thorne. So a lot of the amazing the amazing visualizations that you see in this movie came from his his theory of what a black hole would look like visually. We've never been able to see one. Uh, so what you're seeing here is a supermassive black hole that contains the mass of about 10 million suns. It's a lot of suns. This is a, a number that astronomers refer to as hell of big. <laughs> and so what you're really seeing here is not the light from the black hole, you're seeing the accretion disk of material around the black hole. And so this is a bunch of hot gas and dust that's being heated up as it accelerates by being pulled by the gravity of this black hole. And it looks like it has kind of this double structure to it, right? We have this horizontal disk that cuts across it, and then this vertical disk that wraps around it. But what we're actually seeing is a single disk. Uh, the black hole is so massive that it gravitationally interacts with the light behind it and lenses it around the black hole and puts it into your eye. And so you see this, this version of the accretion disk behind the black hole uh, wrapping around the edges of the black hole. And so this was Kip Thorne's work to visualize what it would actually look like. And so I'm gonna call this science. <laughs> Let's talk about some other stuff that happens in this <laughs> So something that else, something else that happens is Matthew McConaughey. Uh, spoilers. There's going to be a couple of spoilers in this. Uh, nothing too major. But Matthew McConaughey flies into a black hole and he survives, which is miraculous. Uh, so let's talk about what would happen if you were to fly towards a black hole. So first, you would start to get stretched a little bit. And that's because the mass of the black hole is so intense that its gravitational field is actually significantly stronger where your feet are than where your head is. And so you would be pulled in a disproportionate way and stretched and squeezed in a very uncomfortable kind of way. And this is something that astronomers refer to as spaghettification. <laughs> that was not a joke. That's true. <laughs> it would be uncomfortable <laughs> So I'm going to go ahead and say that surviving on the black hole, fiction. Okay. So one other thing that happens is as McConaughey approaches the black hole, he ends up on this planet that's pretty nearby it. Uh, time slows down for him. You can see. <laughs> and this is something that happens. This is a real physical effect uh, called time dilation. And what's really happening here is the black hole is so massive that it bends space-time completely down. It, it puts a dent in space-time so massive uh, that it basically punctures it. And what happens is the space-time near the black hole gets stretched. So it takes longer to travel along that length of space-time. But light can't slow down. It always has to go at the same speed. So to account for it, time slows down. And so this is a real effect that we observed uh, even just from the gravitational pull of the Earth. When we put satellites into space, we actually have to uh, synchronize their clocks with the clocks on the surface of the Earth because they're experiencing a less significant gravitational pull than we do on the surface. So that is some quality science. <laughs> All right. Moving on to another movie that... Uh, and a, a great book and a great movie that got a lot of attention for being very scientifically accurate. Uh, science advisor Dr. Jim Green, NASA. So here's a nice Martian landscape with Matt Damon, of course. 
So let's talk about getting to Mars, uh, the first step in this journey. So in the book, they talk about making this transfer from Mar Earth to Mars, not by making the shortest distance in our orbit, which would only be half the distance to the sun, but instead meeting up with Mars on the opposite side of the sun from where we are. And this is called a home in orbit. It was theorized decades ago. Uh, and it's, it's what we use is an effective way to get to Mars. And were we to send astronauts to Mars, it's probably the method that we would end up using. So I'm going to go ahead and say science. Another thing that happens that starts off the movie is there's a very dramatic dust storm on Mars. And as you know, Mars is kind of a dusty, rusty, red rock out in space. And so there's lots of very fine, powdery sand and dust on the surface. And the, the wind speeds of the surface get incredibly fast. And in the book, it says that the wind speed got up to 175 kilometers per hour, which is about 110 miles per hour. That's very fast. Uh, so I'm going to need a volunteer, someone who's brave enough to be willing to experience the, the force of, of winds on Mars. Yeah, come on up. <laughs> Alright, get, get a nice sturdy stance, brace yourself. Are you ready? <laughs> Alright, you've got a very strong stance, very good. Thank you. <laughs> so nothing happened. Uh, she stayed standing there uh, very well. So what's happening? The air pressure on Mars is actually significantly lower than the air pressure on Earth. And that's because the atmosphere is so much thinner. It's made almost entirely out of carbon dioxide, and it doesn't have uh, the same heavier elements like oxygen and nitrogen that we have in our atmosphere. And so a uh, wind speed of 110 miles per hour on the Earth would only feel like about 10 miles per hour on Mars. And just for reference, the wind speed in Seattle today was about 12 miles per hour. So I think all of you made it here pretty easily without getting blown 30 feet up into the air and missing your spaceship home. Uh, you know, it's a picture. They had to get the story started somehow. So let's move on to another movie. I'm only going to talk about one thing in this movie. There's a lot of, a lot of very interesting, accurate stuff going on uh, in terms of satellites crashing and exciting stuff happening. But there is one thing that I've never really gotten over after watching this movie, and I'm going to show it to you. So where we last left our heroes, they were swinging from a rope from a space station, and they were, <laughs> they were at rest with respect to the space station. And here they are, at rest with respect to each other. And they are holding on to a nice little rope, tether. And were they to pull themselves towards each other, they would most certainly move towards each other. Wait, no. <laughs> where are you going? Back. Bullet, where are you going? <laughs> So this is something that I think would make Sir Isaac Newton very unhappy. <laughs> I think he would remind Mr. Clooney that the acceleration of an object is equal to it's the force acting on it divided by the mass of that object. And if the force acting on that object is zero, the acceleration of that object is going to be zero, and he's not going to go anywhere. Uh, so unless there's something, some ghost force pulling him uh, away, then he's going to stay right where he is, and probably move towards the ship, because that's where Sandra Bullock is falling. I'm going to go and say, fiction. So, <laughs> here's a movie that I could talk about for a very long time. I could spend hours talking about this movie. But, for the sake of time, I'm just going to go through a few very quick points, uh, because there's a lot to cover. So let's start with just a few, a few things. Uh, humans haven't lived on the Earth in this film for thousands of years, but everything has apparently evolved to kill them. Why? <laughs> <laughs> Jaden Smith uh, turns on a radio transmitter, and it shoots a laser into space. <laughs> could be a precursor, he says, to mass expansion. And an asteroid storm is imminent. I don't, I don't know what any of that means. <laughs> I got nothing. 
The way that he detects it is he takes off his wedding ring, holds it to the hull of his ship, and goes to the pilot and says, we got Graviton build up. <laughs> I'm serious. Please don't. Please don't say me. Um, so we've returned to our beautiful Tatooine sunset. We put on the Tatooine, uh, as promised. So we have this planet that is apparently habitable. It's lived on by some moisture farmers. And it orbits two suns. So does this happen? Well, let's talk about, uh, let's talk about stars with companions. And it turns out that about 80% of the stars that are visible to the naked eye have a companion around them. And it's very common for these high-mass stars that are very bright to have, have other stars orbiting them. And here's a nice little dance that they do. And you can see that this companion star actually has a much smaller star, probably a brown dwarf, orbiting it as well. And so there's three stars, uh, two and a half or three stars in this system. And it is possible for planets in these kind of binary systems to have, or for, for stars in these kind of binary systems to have planets around them. Uh, and there's two configurations possible, right? You could have a planet that orbits around one of the stars individually and passes periodically between the two stars, such as this planet that we're approaching now. And we'll take a closer look at what the view from this planet might look like. So as we come into view, you can see, yeah, that looks that looks kind of like what what Luke was gazing longingly off into the distance towards. Um, but we can do better. I think we can find something a little more similar. Uh, so yeah, these stars can have planets, but there is a, a system called Kepler 16b, the center of which is two stars in a binary system. One is a more massive yellow dwarf, and then a smaller red dwarf, and they orbit each other. They orbit at the same center of mass. And there's an exoplanet that orbits around both of them, and so it has two suns. And so a view from this planet might look something like this. This is a nice travel poster if you're ever interested in visiting Kepler 16b. They have a great tourism department. So this looks pretty, pretty similar. There's, a, there's the view from, from Luke's hut. So I'm going to go ahead and say, science. Good job, Star Wars. Okay, so something else that happens in this movie, uh, actually in the next movie, is Han Solo flies into an asteroid field in the Millennium Falcon. And you can see there's an explosion, and we're going to see some sweet maneuvers, and we're going to get one more explosion. And... Nice. Okay. <laughs> So is this what an asteroid field would really look like? Is this an accurate depiction of what we would be seeing? Get a lot of no's. You been there? So if you were to visit the asteroid belt, you'd be more likely to see something that just looks like this. And this is probably the most you would ever see in the asteroid belt. Uh, we've got a large asteroid that's actually being orbited by a much smaller asteroid that's its moon. And so this is probably the most crowded it's going to get. Uh, there, are, there are many, many objects, many, many millions of objects in the asteroid belt, but the distances between them are so vast that you wouldn't be able to see any asteroids were you to stand on an asteroid. You also wouldn't be able to stand on an asteroid. You kind of have to cling to it, because um, they're not very massive. What, uh, what Han Solo was flying through looked much more similar to the ring system of a large gas, gas giant, uh, like this... Uh, artist impression of what the rings of Saturn might look like, where the material is much closer together in this kind of way. So, were they flying through the rings of a, of a gas giant? You called it an asteroid field. It's hard to tell. So I'm going to go ahead and say science fiction. <laughs> <laughs> it was also long, long ago and far, far away. So, <laughs> different time, different place. Right. So we've seen this rise recently in a lot of sci-fi movies trying to be as scientifically accurate as possible. Things like The Martian and Interstellar uh, try to get it right as much as possible and only sacrifice that to drive a story forward. And I think this is really promising. A lot of people are asking questions like, is this really what a black hole would look like? And I think that's an awesome, an awesome trend in movies. Um, but it's also important to kind of keep in mind that not everything you see in a sci-fi movie is going to be accurate even if it's the claim for having high accuracy. Either way, space is awesome. <laughs> So thanks so much for coming out, everyone. I keep watching you.
questions about anything I talk about? So the question was for uh, for binary systems, how does the companion star form? How does the second star in that system form? That's the question. Um, I'm actually not sure. I'm not sure how it forms in every case. I think in crowded nebulae where you have clusters of stars forming, uh, nebulae are, are clouds of gas and dust that collapse into stars, so the, the birthplace of stars. In crowded, crowded uh, clusters of stars, you're going to get stars forming much nearer to each other than like the Earth, or, or sorry, our sun. It's in a much more isolated part of the Milky Way. Whereas you can have uh, binary and trinary and log star systems that form together in these much more dense regions of gas and dust in the galaxy. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. That's another good question. And that's something you see in almost every sci-fi movie. Yeah, uh, yeah the, the question was, would you really have an explosion uh, with flames and that kind of thing in space? Uh, and it's something you see in pretty much every every sci-fi movie. Explosions are definitely possible in space, but the kind of flames that you, you tend to see would not last very long. That, that's oxygen burning, that's what you're seeing. Um, but when when gases combust, they do, uh, they do Turn into very hot vapor. So it's, it's possible for explosions to happen in space, but not kind of flames. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Yeah, the question was how is a day defined in binary systems? So we have those two configurations, right? We have circumbinary systems where we have a planet that orbits around both of the stars, and the day would be pretty similar to our days on the Earth. Right, the the suns, the, the two suns are in the same direction, and so you're receiving light from basically one side as you rotate. It gets complicated when you're on a planet that orbits in between the, the uh, path of two stars, because at some point in the orbit there will be no night on that planet. Uh, you'd be right between the two stars, and it would be there'd be daytime all over the planet. So <laughs> leave that up to the aliens that live there. Question way in the back. Uh, in the picture of the black hole, uh, would, it be, would it be possible to see the uh, jets coming out the top of the bottom? Top of the bottom? Would that be invisible in a situation like this? So the question was, would we be able to see the jets coming out of the top and the bottom of this supermassive black hole? Um, and what I suspect is that those jets are primarily very high energy that our eyes can't detect. Uh, things that are we can pick up with with X-ray telescopes and, and things that are able to see much more wavelengths than our eyes are capable of. So I don't think visibly we'd be able to see it. We might be able to see the gas that's excited by those jets uh, if that release visible light. But I don't think the jets themselves would be able to see it. It's a good question. So the, the question is, in the film Interstellar, they spend about 10 minutes on this planet near the black hole, and many years pass uh, on the ship that's more distant. And and so is time dilation that intense? Yeah, it's it's powerful near something this massive, right? This this gargantua, I think is what they call it in the film, is a hundred million times more massive than our sun. And so the gravitational field as you approach it gets incredibly strong, and so. Uh, the time violation would be significant. Yeah. The closer you are to it, the more the more intense the time violation will be. So, science and movies, you're in both of them. What's your most egregious example of a movie that got science, basic science wrong? Because I have mine, I want to know what yours is. <laughs> Alright, uh, so many. Uh, <laughs> After Earth is, is one that's on the big one because it just it's madness, it's crazy through the entire thing. Uh, one that I saw recently that I loved was Geostorm. 
like not last year, okay. through our quote with an astrophysicist. So it's a grid of satellites around the Earth that are physically connected to each other, and they control the weather. It's great. <laughs> through like sonic waves. So that, that, that my mind. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what comes to mind right now. Well, what's yours? Okay. There's two movies that do it. One is Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea, the original one. The other one is G.I. Joe. Two, two words. Well, actually, three words. Ice freaking floats. <laughs> in Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea, the, the Van Allen Bell catches fire, for those of you who haven't seen it. Catches fire. And ice comes down and hits a submarine. And then in G.I. Joe, don't judge, I saw it when I was drunk. <laughs> they are fighting this battle, and they shoot missiles in the ice cap. And there is a line that uh, someone says, look out, the ice cap's coming down. And you think Michael Bay would just look at his cocktail and realize that doesn't work. <laughs> but those are mine. Ice freaking floats. I love it. I'm gonna I'm gonna watch G.I. Joe now. I'm inspired. <laughs> oh don't do that on my on my account, please. I feel so guilty. Alright. Bye. Excellent question. The question was, when falling into a black hole, what would an outside observer see? And so when you think of when you think of the situation in Interstellar, right, you have someone getting closer to a black hole, and for them, very little time passes, but for an outside observer, a lot of time passes. And so as you get closer to a black hole, from their perspective, you would slow down. And the closer you got, to the black hole, the slower you would get, and you would never see someone actually fall into a black hole. Uh, they would get to the event horizon and not be able to move any further in your reference frame, essentially. Or they would be moving so incredibly slow that you would be able to, you would never be able to see them fall into that black hole. That is a great question uh, of general relativity. Yeah, so the question was, are they actually still there? Uh, and it's, it's all relative. Uh, it, it depends on your reference frame. In your reference frame, they are still there. In their reference frame, it's, it's not. <laughs> they, they, would, they would fall into a black hole in their reference frame. But from your reference frame, you would never see them in a black hole. Uh, I don't think we're drunk enough to ask any harder black hole questions yet, so I'm going to call it there. Let's thank Nick one more time. We're going to take a five-minute break before giving trivia results. So this is a good time to go get a drink, to go use the restroom. I'll see you in a few minutes.